Okay, welcome to Beginners Academy. Uh, we meet weekly on Zoom and every other meeting we try to have a talk or a program and tonight uh, Mark Cantrell, KD4 IMA has volunteered uh, to give us a, a presentation, a real fox hunt. And Mark, a longtime amateur, but also a professional in the fish and wildlife service, I'll say. And with that, we'll turn it over to Mark Cantrell. All right. Uh, thank you, Greg, and appreciate uh, you inviting me to make this presentation. And uh, I'll uh, a bit of a disclaimer first. I, I actually prepared uh, this talk back before the COVID, I think. Uh, uh, way back. So if I forget some of the slides or I'm uh, act like I'm surprised when I, I turn the page and see something, it's probably because I forgot that I did it. But uh, I want to talk about a real fox hunt uh, this evening. Uh, KD4 IMA. I've been, list, uh, let's see, been uh, licensed as an amateur for 31 years now, I think. I uh, date that along with uh, the age of my oldest daughter. So I uh, got my license back in the days when they uh, took, a, took a long time to get it to you, took the test and uh, received the license uh, when my daughter was about a week old. So uh, uh, that was some four or five months later, I think. Anyway, a uh, real fox hunt. K4 IMA here and let's see. There. So if you, are you seeing the entire screen or is it, uh, I guess I'm covered up here a bit with my, oh, I'll undock all the friendly faces and there I can see the rest of my screen. Uh, so from the ARRL, Amateur Radio Direction Finding, it's uh, typically referred to as a fox hunt. So uh, we don't have to see a complete show of hands, but how many of you have ever participated in a fox hunt? Me. <laughs> okay, so there's Jim, yeah. Uh, I see Jim waving a hand there at least. So, uh, and, and Greg, uh, so that's, uh, that's good. So uh, a fox hunt is, uh, uh, takes place fairly often in some areas I've looked uh, there's actually an uh, amateur radio direction finding event calendar on the AWRL web page hasn't been updated in a little bit but uh, uh, looked like before well even uh, last year that there were uh, uh, events going on every weekend cities and towns all across the country uh, where folks would gather on hilltops for a fox hunt and so uh, a typical uh, Amateur radio fox hunt uh, em employs a small low power transmitter uh, that's hidden and the rest of the crew uh, will go out and try to find it. And, uh, and so it, because it is a low power transmitter, it sometimes can be real challenging and a lot of fun, uh, especially if, uh, if there's some terrain to deal with. And, uh, and what this does, it's a great activity that uh, amateurs can use to, uh, to polish their skills. And, uh, and some of us are a little more competitive than others, uh, uh, polish their skills and have fun uh, looking, for, uh, looking for the transmitter. And uh, it helps you then in case of uh, uh, real world applications when you might want to uh, locate an amateur radio operator who's maybe not identifying and uh, doing some of the stuff you hear over on the, uh, 40 meters and, and some other local uh, hangouts uh, uh, where folks are, are not uh, not being good amateurs. And so uh, the FCC as well as uh, uh, amateurs can can track those folks down uh, using some direction finding skills. Uh, the other uh, real application is trying to find a lost hiker, uh, somebody who may uh, uh, may need uh, rescue or direction out and uh, you're able to track them down uh, just by homing in on the signal. So uh, that's amateur radio direction finding, uh, fox hunting, and I uh, hope that uh, if you haven't tried it, uh, that you uh, could get interested and, uh, and give it a whirl. Uh, we, could, uh, we could even arrange to uh, set up a fox hunt uh, sometime here. It's springtime. Good, good to be outside and, and try some direction finding uh, there. But, uh, but actually, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is something that, uh, uh, that I do. Uh, for a living and uh, and have for uh, for a number of years, uh, starting out with uh, with raccoons and finding uh, uh, finding animals uh, using uh, direction finding, and uh, and so I'm I am a wildlife biologist and 
have worked for a great many years uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, variety of things with a variety of wildlife and uh, and also with fish. Uh, so I, I was an overachiever, uh, as Christina likes to say. I was born at a very early age, and so uh, I uh, I took off through college and uh, and got really interested in in uh, hunting and fishing and wildlife, the things that I, I was always uh, doing outside. Uh, but learned that there was some science behind uh, management and uh, research with uh, wildlife and fisheries. And so that's something that I've uh, enjoyed as a career. And, uh, and so some of this, uh, this is what I started doing in, uh, in graduate school about the same time that I got interested in amateur radio. So... So uh, what I want to do this evening is uh, uh, go through some slides here and talk about uh, some similarities with amateur radio, uh, then tell you about some of the animals that I've worked with and some of the challenges and adventures uh, that I've, uh, I've enjoyed through the years. So uh, the purposes uh, of using uh, radio direction finding with, uh, with wildlife is usually uh, designed to peer into the hidden worlds of, of those wild animals. Uh, most of the time as a wildlife biologist, we want to define uh, interactions of an animal with its environment uh, and its habitat preferences. How far does it go? When does it move? Uh, is it active in the daylight or dark? Uh, things that go along with, uh, with those uh, uh, just basic uh, movement patterns. Uh, how does it interact with other animals? Uh, is it interacting for breeding or territoriality? Uh, also uh, being able to, to understand predator and prey uh, interactions uh, is important uh, for, uh, uh, for managing wildlife and for managing their habitats. And so one of the, one of the things that we do in, in studying wildlife uh, with, uh, uh, with radio direction finding, and especially with telemetry, measuring them from a distance is we want to do that with uh, minimal disturbance or disruption of those normal patterns. So this gives us a way to, uh, to peek inside without disturbing the animal or, or trying to disturb it uh, very little uh, so that we get a true pattern of, of what's going on uh, with, uh, with the species. So uh, some of the challenges, uh, biggest challenges you can find is, is how do you attach a radio to an animal? And, uh, and especially, how do you attach uh, a small uh, transmitter to an animal so that you follow it uh, without disrupting its uh, uh, behavior? And so as a general rule of thumb, we have to have a transmitter that is small enough that it doesn't exceed about three, and a half, three to five percent of the animal's body weight for a mammal. For birds, there's some special considerations. You don't want a transmitter so big that the bird can't fly. I think and, the uh, animal might uh, be tracking it very far. Some of the some of the other things that uh, you think about fish, you're a little more buoyant, and so they can carry a little bit more weight uh, without uh, notice because the weight is uh, uh, is offset by the buoyancy, and so we uh, still need to keep the the overall weight of, uh, of transmitter below 7% of, uh, of, of the body weight. But that's just a round figure. So you think about it uh, and you can think about your own uh, girth and what it might mean to carry something around that's three to 5% of your, uh, your body weight and, uh, and wonder if that would uh, disturb you very much. Some days I can't even pick up a 12 ounce can. Uh, so, so you wanna, wanna make sure and minimize that, uh, that effect. And so there's a, here's a picture of a raccoon. Like I said, uh, one of the first uh, species that I, uh, I did, uh, did an independent study on for about uh, three years, uh, uh, capturing, tagging uh, with, uh, with not only a radio transmitter attached to a collar, but also ear tags to identify individuals uh, in that way. Uh, but tracking and then, uh, then following up uh, with that, uh, that critter. So uh, first of all, a little bit on the design of transmitters. Uh, typically, uh, they're, uh, they're putting a radio collar design, and we've seen the far side commercials, uh, all the, the cartoons of uh, radio uh, transmitters and collars, and this is something that, uh, that I've used a good many of. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy, just like putting a collar on a dog, 
and the transmitter is there and the antenna may, may poke out uh, in a vertical position or it may be uh, included in the collar uh, wrapping around the neck to keep it from snagging and brush. Uh, another one I've done is with uh, birds. We put this on just kind of a backpack fashion uh, on the bird. But again, remember, it needs a smaller weight in order to, uh, uh, to avoid uh, impacting the, the movement of, uh, uh, of the bird. So uh, <clears throat> some of the history of, uh, of uh, wildlife telemetry and tracking of wildlife uh, started back in the uh, 1950s. Some of the earliest uh, uh, work was done by uh, some very pioneering uh, folks. Uh, the Craigheads uh, were two brothers. Uh, Frank uh, Craighead uh, just passed away a few years ago, but uh, they worked in, with grizzly bears in Yellowstone. And they developed these uh, radio tracking collars that you may, uh, may see resemble uh, just what you can buy now in the store to, to radio track uh, dogs. But uh, this design was typically just a simple beep, beep uh, design, a pulsed uh, transmission, and it required a lot of uh, labor-intensive manual tracking. Uh, the transmitters uh, and the battery is all contained here in the, uh, <clears throat> in the collar hanging below the animal's neck. And, uh, and it's given out that pulse beep, and then it's up to the wildlife researcher, such as myself, to go out and, uh, and track the animal down and to follow up on it, see where it is. Nowadays, uh, with the uh, latest in, in radio uh, transmitter construction, uh, you can get some digital, uh, uh, digital telemetry. Uh, that includes things like temperature sensing, activity sensing, whether uh, with a little uh, uh, gyro uh, so that you can tell if the animal's moving. And some of that now is, uh, is actually, uh, instead of just a transmitter that's, uh, that's pulsing along blindly, uh, beeping, uh, it actually is gathering information, gathering information from satellites, uh, just like APRS, uh, to, uh, okay. to then send back out a location uh, directly to the uh, receiver. Whereas uh, I'll, I'll talk some more about uh, the ways we, uh, we're doing the fox hunting, uh, direction finding with, uh, with the simple beep beep of, uh, of these uh, collars there on the screen uh, that, uh, that worked, uh, worked quite well and still does. Uh, so there's even some, some newer systems, these digital systems, Argo systems that are, uh, that are using Doppler shift and uh, picked up, uh, received by satellites, uh, the global star satellites. And then the iridium and uh, uh, things like that are, are, are part of the digital setup. So one. Doing it as a uh, R&D, uh, but it had a capture option. And that capture option actually uh, embedded in the uh, uh, transmitter itself was a uh, uh, a dart uh, so that you could uh, activate that. It would uh, not only was there a transmitter there, but there was a receiver that could receive a signal. Coded signal would uh, would cause this uh, this dart to uh, uh, to pop out and uh, and tranquilize the animal uh, so that you could capture it easily. So that uh, that was a pretty fancy. Uh, bit of uh, technology there, and it worked some. So uh, in, in terms of direction finding, the antenna, uh, you guys know from amateur radio is all important. And most of the uh, antennas that I used were, uh, were directional antennas, these uh, multi-element uh, Yagi Udu designs uh, that, uh, that had, of course, a driven element uh, that was uh, fed uh, along with a uh, directional element in the front and a longer uh, reflecting element behind that uh, driven element. So that worked where there's a three, five, I think was this one that we used on the top of a vehicle or the one that I used the most was just a simple two element handheld uh, antenna with, <laughs> with a driven element and one reflector uh, behind it. And, uh, and so that, uh, that sort of uh, antenna with a handheld uh, grip on it is one that, uh, that I've drug through the woods quite a bit uh, with me. So uh, at times I'll, I'll mention that, uh, that I used a mag mount omnidirectional antenna and uh, 
and that was most useful uh, when you were traveling over big distances and hadn't seen the animal in a while, hadn't found it uh, or detected the beep. And, and so uh, the omnidirectional antenna, you could cover a lot of ground if you were driving along the highway and, uh, and receive the, the beep beep. Uh, then uh, you could pick it up and once you got, uh, got close enough, you could then go to, to the standard direction finding uh, that I'll describe here in a bit. But that uh, that mag mount with the omnidirectional antenna worked great uh, when I was driving along roads, uh, radio tracking fish. Uh, so fish, I could figure they're going to be in the river, and I'm driving along the road, and I come around the bend, and then you hear uh, pick up and detect the, the beep of the fish. And then you could get uh, get out and uh, uh, with the direction finding antenna, uh, pinpoint which pool or riffle the fish was in. Works with the river otters, uh, another another species that I worked a good bit with, and uh, and was able to generally figure that they were going to be in the river or or near it. So if I could drive along the river uh, and find it, uh, I could then get closer. So uh, and, and that was uh, just simply I took a uh, an amateur radio a five eighths. Uh, wave mag mount antenna uh, made for two meters and uh, one that I got from Radio Shack, Shack and I trimmed it down to frequency. So uh, one of the other things I'll, I'll talk about this uh, pretty complex, uh, I think they call it a simplex system, but it's a, a complex <laughs> using global star transmission. And, uh, and it really has uh, uh, a satellite network that covers uh, pretty much most of, uh, most of the earth and a good bit of the oceans in between. It's real helpful, but pretty expensive. So I, uh, I won't talk much about that because I have not been able to, uh, to experience that, uh, that system uh, that's being made uh, there. But again, prices are, are coming down all the way around for, uh, for all of us. And uh, as technology's leaping ahead and just look what's in your cell phone and what all can be done with that these days. So. Somebody's tracking you too. Uh, manufacturers, I just mentioned Telonix. Uh, that's one of the systems that I used a good bit and wildlife materials was one of the very first uh, that was uh, constructed. Uh, and um, uh, some of the radio callers I showed a, a minute ago were, uh, were constructed by wildlife materials uh, out of uh, uh, Southern Illinois. Uh, the 3M folks got involved when they thought there might be some money in it, uh, did some R&D for a few years, and then sold that, uh, that section off, and I think it fizzled pretty quickly. And that was the capture collar I talked about that we used on some red wolves when I was doing uh, work in the uh, Great Smokies uh, National Park, and we did a, a reintroduction. And, of course, with wolves, uh, that was uh, one, of the, one of the critters for – consideration that uh, that we really wanted to be able to get our hands on on that animal and knock it down and drug it uh, uh, without injury and uh, and having to, to trap it. Wolves are pretty smart. You trap them once and put a radio collar on them, they aren't going to fall for a trap so easily the next time. Uh, so that's why that capture collar uh, was a really good idea and it did work, uh, but there was a lot of complications you had to consider uh, as well. You had to be close to the animal before you you hit that button to knock it down because it's not going to stay drugged for very long, and you want to get to it uh, and make sure that uh, that when you drug it, uh, you pop that uh, capture dart. That uh, that number one, the dose that you estimated uh, matches what the animal weighs on that date, and uh, uh, and number two, you want to make sure that when the uh, critter went down that it wouldn't fall into the creek and drown or something of that sort. So you had to be pretty close uh, before you pop that, uh, that, uh, that uh, little burst that, uh, that would explode uh, with a CO2 cartridge and inject the, the dart. So uh, that was some, some real specialty stuff, a lot of fun to work with, but uh, it didn't, didn't take off that much. So uh, one of the other things that I've been working with lately uh, here in Florida, we're putting in a couple of systems that uh, is kind of a telemetry thing and it's, uh, it's meant to detect uh, animals. It's an intrusion detection uh, sensor system. Uh, so it's used for border surveillance and protection, power stations, uh, oil and gas field protection, monitoring airfields. You can think about all the things that you can do uh, similar to, uh, to putting out a, a security system at your own house. Uh, but we're applying this for wildlife crossings in, uh, 
uh, in South Florida, just to detect uh, animals, especially panthers, that uh, panthers are endangered and we wanna make sure that uh, we reduce the number of road hits and, uh, and make sure those animals are able to cross without being hit. And so what this, uh, the systems uh, that we're using now uh, detects the animals uh, with, uh, with this IDS system uh, using a whole uh, uh, passive infrared and, uh, and seismic uh, uh, detection. Uh, and then lights go on and start flashing. So if a car is approaching, uh, they know that there's uh, wildlife in, in the zone uh, that they're approaching for them to slow down. And we've been able to, uh, to identify areas, what we call hot spots, uh, where wildlife cross. And, and you all know, uh, driving the roads at night, uh, maybe you, you know where you generally will tend to see deer out beside the roadway. And guess what? If you see deer out there, that might be a good place to see a panther too. Uh, so, so this helps us to detect uh, wildlife when they're on or near the roadway and then warn drivers to, to take uh, measures to avoid and slow down. Uh, so that's, that's part of the wildlife crossings that we're working on. So I just mentioned that as, as one of the other uh, other ways that we're coming at uh, some solutions uh, to, uh, uh, to, to help to manage wildlife. So uh, here, I'll, I'll go back and tell you some more about the system that I used uh, in graduate school uh, and then, then later uh, doing wildlife research. Uh, typical setup with Tlonix receiver, uh, pretty fancy device here. Uh, these were receivers that, uh, that worked uh, generally in the 150 to 152 megahertz range. Uh, 161 was what the federal folks used, uh, but as researchers, we were in the 150 to 152, not a primary user uh, in that, uh, that range, but uh, we use these in a leather carrying case around your neck with, the, again, the two-element Yagi uh, antenna. They're that H-shaped. Uh, these had elements that screwed on uh, longer as well. But with this, uh, this receiver stuck down into the uh, leather carrying case and earphones, we could, uh, uh, could track uh, individual uh, wildlife, uh, raccoons. And so the way you see this, uh, basically, uh, if you see the channel that we would design in, generally it's one, one study animal, one transmitter per frequency. And we dialed these in pretty precisely. And uh, we did this with the, uh, the narrow range of the, the receiver, the way it was constructed. And this would be 152, 152.97. And then you could dial in and tune in. Uh, this one would be 152.970. And so that's the way that we, uh, we could tune in on an individual frequency. And then you could just toggle these numbers uh, to go to the next frequency that you were listening on, uh, usually separating by at least three clicks our uh, individual study animals and uh, listen for the next animal. And, uh, and so that was, uh, uh, that was how I used uh, these Telonix receivers with the H, uh, H antenna direction finding. Uh, the example would be that, uh, and this is, this is again a great technique for amateur radio direction finding, is by triangulation. Uh, this involved uh, finding some high spots where it had good, uh, uh, good view of uh, the area around and, uh, and looking at uh, acute angles and take a couple of readings, at least two readings uh, with a compass to find the shortest time interval between the readings uh, to find the animal. Again, if it's wildlife, it may be moving. You wanna be able to uh, uh, point the antenna and, uh, and then go to the next spot and point it uh, uh, again and, uh, and triangulate on the location uh, with a compass and uh, uh, in this direction, directional antenna. So for example, uh, this is a study, one of the study areas here on Burnett Hollow and White Creek that, uh, that I used, and I'd pick out areas that were easily identified on a topo map, being the junction of a road uh, here, or a bend in the road, or a high spot uh, on a ridge line, or, uh, or again, another identified area on the road. Picking out high spots, these were typical locations to, uh, to set up and do radio tracking all night long. And, uh, and with that, you go to the first area and simply 
find the direction of the nearest study animal. And, uh, and this, you know, uh, a point in, in the azimuth here would, would be about 100 degrees, uh, 100 degrees off of north, and uh, then race down the road to the next point and take a, a compass bearing in the direction of the strongest signal. And again, this is a beep, beep, beep. So, uh, so it had to, had to depend on being real, having sensitive ears, had another, uh, the wildlife uh, materials incorporated, made a uh, uh, receiver that had a uh, uh, S meter on it, analog S meter that you could look and look at signal strength. Uh, but uh, with the telonics, you were relying on your, uh, the earphones and, uh, and simply the strongest signal strength uh, would be the direction uh, that you would take the compass bearing. And where these two points crossed uh, would be the location of the animal. And, uh, and, and generally on a uh, monthly basis, we do use some test, uh, test transmitters. To, uh, to ensure that uh, your direction finding techniques were good and put those out and then uh, look at what your angle of error was. Uh, within two to four degrees was pretty good. And that would give you uh, an area, a zone here that you were pretty sure the animal was in. And so you do that a few more times, again, from these points, multiple points. And you do that over the course of a nighttime or a week or two or a month or even an entire season, uh, use that to numerically describe the area covered uh, either by an ellipse that would capture those, those points uh, to describe, describe, say, the winter home range uh, of an animal. And so if uh, these were the points that I'd found uh, a raccoon over the course of a season, I would describe this uh, numerically, the size, size and shape of that area. Do the same thing. Uh, say for the springtime and the animal might be shifted over here and uh, describe that area. Uh, I know that was a cornfield and sometimes by summertime these animals would shift to go to the corn when it was right and so uh, so all of these were were, uh, were methods to describe and estimate the size of the say the total home range uh, of an animal and, uh, and this is a pretty typical sort of uh, information that wildlife biologists would use for, uh, for managing, be it uh, deer, turkeys, uh, uh, raccoons, uh, managing the animals, uh, looking at density, uh, looking at their movements and how far they had to move to find uh, their annual uh, needs, be it uh, annual needs for food or for finding, uh, finding a, a mate. So again, that was, that was using this Telonix uh, receiver and uh, uh, typical setup with headphones and direction finding. That, uh, that was the, the equipment used and the technique uh, there for triangulation. Uh, pretty much uh, the same technique that's been used for at least the past uh, 50 or 60 years. Uh, some of the advanced applications that I did, uh, Telonix sold this uh, scanner that mounted on top of the receiver and it would scan across all the frequencies. You could program in uh, the frequencies of 25 or 50 different animals. And then you could go through an area just scanning the channels until you found one. It gave you a uh, good way of searching a wide area. I did this from uh, airplane uh, and with the same antenna, same direction finding antenna, uh, used two of those with a simple antenna switch between them. Uh, and, uh, and you could listen on left ring, wing and right wing. And then uh, as you were flying along, if you picked up, uh, picked up one of the beep beeps on a particular frequency, you could stop the scanner and then uh, home in on that particular uh, individual uh, transmitter uh, just by switching from the left antenna to the right antenna until, uh, until you figured which side of the, uh, the airplane it was on. And then we would kind of uh, do a figure eight uh, switching antennas until we could home in on it and uh, uh, often slow down enough to even see the animal on the ground. For, for black bears, it was pretty easy to see them in a tree or see them on the ground. Uh, so uh, it's pretty harrowing stuff. It was great to find, find an animal, but, uh, but radio tracking a black bear in the Great Smokies, uh, the, the weather could be interesting. And uh, I had at least one, one instance that, uh, that gave me a pretty good startle. 
uh, we were zooming in just about stall speed, slowing down to 60 or 70 miles an hour in, uh, in this little high wing uh, Cessna, uh, flipping back and forth, concentrating on, uh, on looking at the ground, trying to, uh, trying to determine based on the uh, two direction finding antennas where, where on earth that, uh, that bear was and uh, doing that figure eight. And uh, we hit a downdraft and flying at five to 600 feet above ground uh, on a pretty steep terrain. And we dropped about 160 feet vertically, sideways. Uh, and uh, it gave me a pretty good jolt. And then later when we got down on the ground, I asked the pilot if, uh, if he was scared. And, uh, and he said, well, were you scared? And I said, well, no, I, I will only base my fear on whether you were afraid. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was trusting him. And he said, well, that was a pretty good jolt. And there was not much way uh, for us to pull out of that one had we dropped on farther down into the trees. So uh, anyway, a lot of uh, interesting terrain and, uh, and techniques that, uh, that were, were pretty fun and, uh, and good, uh, good direction finding, uh, gathered a lot of great data and, uh, and got a got a few good scares out of it too. But it, it works, especially aerial tracking in areas where there aren't any roads. Uh, that was the technique we used, such as in the uh, uh, Great Smokies in the national parks. We use this a lot in South Florida, uh, just because it's so hard to, uh, to get around. And, and I started a study over in Apalachicola National Forest in uh, uh, Bradwell Bay area uh, for bears as well, in which, uh, which that was, Primarily, ninety percent of the uh, radio locations we were able to get on, on bears there uh, were from aerial uh, aerial homing uh, using this technique. So, uh, just uh, kind of a, a nuanced approach to the direction finding and uh, and homing in with that figure eight uh, from an aircraft. So. Uh, one of the, the intriguing things to, to me was uh, was how uh, how we attached, uh, especially in, in, in with special considerations given to animals that we didn't usually radio track. Uh, for instance, river otters. River otters really don't have a neck, and so it's hard to put a, uh, a transmitter and a radio collar and, uh, and stick it around your neck. So, so did a study with uh, with river otters, in which uh, we just had transmitters and uh, they were implanted uh, intraperitoneally. Uh, basically uh, uh, put a little slice in their belly and popped, uh, popped this transmitter in that was about the size of a uh, uh, little bit bigger than, than say a, a D cell uh, flashlight battery and popped that into their belly, stitched it up. But it did require holding those, uh, those critters for a couple of days to make sure they recovered from the anesthesia uh, because we had to knock them out uh, to, to do that surgery and then making sure that their uh, stitches were, were holding and uh, before we released them. So uh, it was a, a little added, uh, a lot of added expense for, uh, for doing the surgery with veterinarian uh, helping out there, uh, but extra holding time and then you have to feed them and, uh, and Lord knows they get hungry as soon as they wake up. So uh, that was uh, a lot of adventures with river otters. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, radio tracking them along, uh, along rivers from a canoe or, uh, or from a uh, truck when the roadway was along the river was really good. But I was amazed at how, uh, how those uh, uh, river otters were able to cross uh, some pretty rough terrain outside of the water. Uh, they will cross uh, dry ground and, and go great distances, especially if, uh, if they've been distant uh, from their natural home range. So uh, river otters, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, another consideration uh, mentioned earlier, birds need to fly so that transmitter must be really lightweight. And, uh, and with that, uh, the way to get a transmitter uh, very lightweight uh, is a balance between battery life and beep. And so if you, uh, if you went with a minimal battery life and slowed that beep down so that you're getting one, uh, one beep every five seconds or so, or seven seconds, it, uh, it really uh, extended the transmitter life uh, expectancy. Uh, so having that, uh, that beep uh, spanned out uh, helped to get there. Uh, some other considerations now, because a lot of birds are soaring birds, some of the, the bigger ones, especially eagles and, uh, 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 and vultures, uh, 
uh, they're able to put a solar pack on with a rechargeable battery. And, uh, and that often helps, uh, helps to extend the transmitter life uh, without adding a lot more uh, battery weight. And uh, so that's, that's one thing to consider. Uh, bears, uh, black bears especially put on a lot of weight fast in the fall time. Uh, before they, uh, they do uh, uh, den up for the uh, winter, they will add about 40 pounds per week in the fall time when they're eating. Uh, like me at Thanksgiving, uh, pretty easy to, uh, to add up uh, those calories, but they gain a lot of weight. And when they're gaining a lot of weight, a radio collar uh, can, can really constrict their neck. And, uh, and so if they add a couple of, couple of hundred pounds over the fall time, uh, we would uh, uh, worked out a, uh, a system of putting a breakaway radio collar on there in order to track the, uh, the bear, the individual, as long as possible without uh, really choking them uh, to death as they were eaten. Uh, we made transmitters uh, into collars that uh, would break away and were designed just to fall off. Uh, we'd track them as long as we could. And then when, uh, when they were bursting at the seams, that transmitter and the radio collar would fall off. And then, uh, then we'd go back uh, later and recover the, the radio collar uh, just because they were expensive radio collars. Uh, we could go back and refurbish those and, uh, and use them again. So that's just some of the special considerations we'd have to do with uh, animals. That challenge again was the battery life, uh, slowing the transmit rate, going to solar power, uh, some with basking turtles and, and eagles, like I mentioned, and, and vultures. They're out in the sun a lot. Uh, you, can, you can get that solar pow power to work. The new digital transmitters are great uh, because they, uh, they don't require as much as the old uh, uh, analog FM transmitters. So uh, that, uh, that really helps uh, going to the digital uh, mode. And some of the new batteries uh, are, are better than the old alkaline batteries that we used to plug into these, uh, uh, these transmitters. Now with some of these, uh, 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 whether it's a nickel, uh, nickel or uh, lithium iron, uh, new batteries are, are great lighter weight as well. So, so all of this was, uh, was the challenge of dealing with the, the bad habits uh, of, of, of transmitters, uh, but also the bad habits of the animals. Uh, bats, for instance, uh, they're out at nighttime, so you can't rely on solar power to recharge that battery. Uh, the other, uh, other thing is they fly around, so they've got to have a really lightweight transmitter. And then they go underground. They go into caves. And, uh, and so it's hard, hard to keep up with, uh, with bats, uh, with radio telemetry. Uh, but we've done it, uh, putting some really small uh, transmitters on them, small batteries, uh, so as not to impede their flight. Uh, and then, uh, then follow them most of the time with, uh, with airplanes, uh, because once they come out of that cave, uh, you got to keep up. Now that gives you a, a good advantage because they're out flying like birds. Uh, the bats are often flying above the treetops. So, uh, so the range, uh, just the physical uh, distances you can pick up a small transmitter uh, with small power is, uh, is, is farther than, uh, than a ground dwelling creature. Uh, so, so they're up there, it helps, but they can move uh, pretty fast, especially if they pick up uh, a tailwind. So that's uh, another, another critter that's a real challenge. And if you can get two weeks out of a transmitter uh, with a bat, uh, such as some of the work we're doing down in South Florida now with Florida bonneted bats, uh, it's, uh, it's a good day. The other thing I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the challenges we had to do was uh, making sure that your frequencies uh, didn't overlap. There's only so many frequencies that you can have between 150 and 152 megahertz or 160, uh, one megahertz. There's a, just so many uh, critters that you can get there. And then if they, uh, if a transmitter lasts uh, a couple of years, uh, then it's overlapping with, uh, with animals from the previous study or if you've got uh, areas that you study a lot of animals in, like I did with, uh, with raccoons and river otters and black bears and, uh, and, and eagles in, in the Smokies, uh, pretty soon you're running out of frequency. So it, it takes a lot of coordination with, uh, with other folks who are doing research in the area to make sure that you're not uh, duplicating a, uh, a particular transmitter frequency. 
uh, because that could create confusion when you're expecting to find a individual animal, say a female black bear, and you expect to find it somewhere and all of a sudden you hear this, uh, this beep beep and it's in the wrong place and maybe it's underwater. And, uh, and so that, that can be a challenge. You know, so whoops, maybe, maybe that's a different critter. And, uh, and so that, uh, that sort of confusion uh, is one that we work out by, uh, by working with other researchers and by working with the transmitter uh, manufacturers to make sure that we don't duplicate a, a frequency that has been used in recent years. Uh, the other, other thing we ran into once is uh, we're, we're certainly not the primary user uh, in tracking wildlife uh, on a particular frequency. And so I had uh, one, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, about a Kentucky line near uh, Cumberland Gap had a particular sheriff's department, uh, I think it was in Union County, Tennessee, that, uh, that used the same frequency uh, as one of my uh, raccoons. And so uh, I, I guess the, the beep beep of that particular raccoon was probably as irritating to them as, uh, as it was for me to be listening intently in the headphones for, uh, uh, for my raccoon and then to hear somebody uh, calling in 1028 uh, back to the station. So, uh, so that was a consideration that we uh, always had to have. So again, uh, just like an amateur radio, uh, especially in these, uh, this frequency range, just a little bit higher uh, uh, megahertz there than the uh, uh, two meter band usually, our uh, signal range could, could be diminished by rugged terrain. Again, the, the Smokies, you get on one side of the ridge, you can't hear it. Uh, other natural obstacles besides mountains, timber, all the dense vegetation in the springtime really cut down the, uh, the distance that we could, uh, uh, could track animals. The other thing, uh, whether it's a bat or a raccoon, if they go into a cave or a hole, uh, you can only hear them possibly in front of that hole. And, uh, and, and then other things, uh, some bats that we tracked down in uh, Eastern North Carolina, if they go into a well, or we found some at uh, uh, Camp McCall down, uh, down near Fort Bragg, uh, we had some, some bats that uh, we were able to find in some big concrete bunkers, uh, underground bunkers. So didn't know the bunkers were out there, uh, left over from World War II, uh, but the bats sure did find them. Uh, but the best, best signal range really is over flat open country, line of sight conditions, or, uh, or from air to ground, or in the case of the bats, the birds, uh, air to air, uh, you're able to, to really get a clear, the, the best signal from, uh, from a small transmitter. And, and again, uh, that balance of battery life, uh, we're looking at uh, something that would be in, uh, especially with uh, some of these smaller wildlife, you wanna stay down to five, 5.8 5 8 gr uh, grams. Uh, with a battery life, that might get you uh, basically six, what's that, th 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 three or four months uh, at best. Uh, if you want to go for a couple of years, you're going to have to uh, to increase the weight of the battery uh, with the same transmitter uh, up to about 15.5 grams. And so that's, that's typical sort of battery life that we're looking at. I generally uh, try to... Uh, to track animals across a, uh, a calendar year, uh, or at least a, uh, three or four seasons. So it's something that would last uh, over 365 days. And I balanced that uh, with the, uh, the pulse. Uh, for instance, a 20 millisecond pulse with uh, uh, 30 ppm uh, that would draw, draw nine milliamps. Uh, and then, uh, then again, the, you could get by with 15 centimeter whip antenna and uh, and that, uh, that would give you a minus three to minus five uh, decibel signal. So uh, just, just an example of some of the considerations and balances uh, to, to put that in a small package with a, a three-stage crystal controlled uh, transmitter. So uh, again, the consideration for a turkey that mostly walks but does fly is, uh, is different from tracking something uh, like a whale that uh, that's underwater a lot, and but could carry a bigger transmitter and a larger battery. Uh, but it only comes up, and you can't uh, can't really tell where it is, except when it comes to the surface uh, to breathe. 
or to breach there. And uh, it's those are all, all considerations in, uh, in tracking wildlife. The other, uh, other group of things I mentioned that for the past few years have been working uh, a lot with, uh, with fishes. They live underwater and you really can't transmit a lot from, uh, from underwater very well. Uh, but some of the fish that, uh, that have tracked uh, do spend some time in shallow riffles. Uh, the sickle fin red horse are really rare fish. And in that case, we are able to use uh, radio transmitters. Uh, in this case, uh, in the 40 to 60 megahertz range, uh, I think we were, uh, and, and using uh, uh, an antenna that was uh, extended outside the transmitter that was, was uh, implanted into the body cavity of the fish and the antenna uh, sticking out of the, uh, uh, of the side of the fish and that could extend to the surface and we could track those, those fish fairly well in shallow rivers. As opposed to lake sturgeon uh, that live deep and on the bottom of big deep rivers, uh, that was a whole different, uh, uh, different ordeal. Uh, American shad, uh, they come into fresh water to spawn. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't feed when they come in to spawn. Uh, they got one thing on their mind, and uh, and so uh, so we're able to put a transmitter rather easily right down their throat uh, with the antenna extending out of the mouth, and didn't bother them a bit uh, to have that uh, that antenna sticking out of their mouth, and that would allow us to to track them for the month or so that they come in to spawn, uh, track their progress up the river uh, into shallow rocky shoals. Uh, so we did that with uh, American shad. Uh, Quite a few, and it's pretty easy then to to stick in those uh, uh, those transmitters and pop in uh, fifty or a hundred uh, transmitters in just uh, uh, just a few hours. A little bit different than putting a transmitter into a river otter so that you have to do surgery on. Uh, major consideration there. So uh, things like these, uh, uh, the lake sturgeon or sharks, marlin that go deep, uh, we use a sonic coated tag uh, and those are implanted and so I'll, uh, let's see uh, maybe show you some of those these operate this is not 69 megahertz this is 69 kilohertz uh, so we're able to transmit a coded pulse through the water a sonic uh, pulse and uh, and so you see these transmitters some of the ones that are used uh, here uh, you can see just from scale of the hand uh, those are great, give you about five years of battery life uh, inside a fish, and it gives a pulse through the water, and we pick that up uh, with a broad network of fixed receivers. Here you can see K4IMA. She's holding a uh, uh, lake sturgeon. Uh, that was a cold day up on the uh, Tennessee River. Uh, she did, uh, did a study for a couple, three years uh, tracking uh, the lake sturgeon. Uh, with transmitters, and, and they were in a, anywhere from 20 to 100 feet of water. And, uh, and so uh, after she implanted these transmitters, again, cutting, uh, uh, cutting through the uh, abdomen of the fish, implant the transmitter, stitch it back up with a couple of blind stitches and a good splash of super glue, uh, release that fish back out and, uh, and, and track it for, for the next five years. Uh, so you can tell it's her again. Uh, if you hadn't seen Christina, she was baking a cake earlier, uh, uh, in actually a couple of cakes uh, for a, an event tomorrow. Uh, but you can tell it's her because she's got on pink rain suit with uh, pretty fancy fingernails, and you can just see her eyes uh, staring out there. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that she did for a number of years. Uh, she has a master's degree in uh, in fisheries biology. And that, uh, that was a project she worked on for, uh, uh, for a good bit up in Tennessee. Uh, but the other thing that we did with lake sturgeon and with a number of animals is use pit tags. Now, this is a great, uh, great way. Uh, this is an RFID pit tag, uh, passive integrated uh, transponder. Uh, this is a real close zoom in on some of these, but you, uh, if you haven't seen one of these pit tags that are used in, in pets, they're in passports. If you come across the border, your passport's got a, uh, got a pit tag in it and it can be read from a distance, depending on the size of the tag, can be read as it uh, goes through a scanner. Uh, and so this helped uh, us to identify individual uh, animals 
by tagging them uh, with a pit tag. Uh, fish, it's great. Uh, then when you recapture the fish, you can use a handheld scanner to, uh, uh, that gives a, an electric pulse and that electric pulse is absorbed by this coil of, uh, of wire and then it emits its own uh, 10 or 15 digit alphanumeric uh, code uh, that the uh, scanner is able to then pick up and read that code. So that alphanumeric code, uh, it, it helps us to identify an individual, uh, again, whether it's your poodle or uh, fish, we use the same ones. We, uh, uh, we use these in fish uh, and mammals, uh, birds, anything that uh, lately that we're putting a transmitter in, a bigger transmitter or radio collar, we'll stick one of these pit tags in just so, uh, so that we can tell what it is. If it loses the transmitter, we can still identify the individual. Uh, so some fish that I've been working with uh, uh, lately, I've been able to, uh, use these pit tags in and they last because they, again, don't require a battery. Uh, they're just charged from the RF uh, that the scanner puts out and they give that, uh, that burst of their unique code. Uh, we've used those uh, and detected them some 25 years later and, uh, and it helps us attract the, the individual uh, fish. Uh, so uh, we've also put out arrays, kind of these uh, big antenna systems across the bottom of the river. And if they swim across it, uh, then, then it gives that pulse and pick it up on the computer. Uh, so it lets us know when they cross a particular point. So uh, some similarities, I'll, I'll just uh, try to wrap this up here real quick. Uh, but some of the VHF bands uh, that we track uh, wildlife on, 148 to 150 megahertz, the 150 to 152. Again, we're not the primary users in these bands, but this tells you where we are. The feds are usually up in the uh, 161, 64, 66 range. And, uh, and we try to, again, have one animal per frequency in any given study area. So uh, the, the similarity uh, between a real fox hunt and the Amateur radio direction finding fox hunt is, uh, is some of the species. I've uh, actually, I've worked with, with a number of things, uh, like I said, raccoons, fox squirrels, river otters, uh, deer, elk, uh, foxes, coyotes, uh, the, the few wolves uh, that we worked with, uh, bats, bears, turkeys, and a whole bunch of different fish species. Uh, each one of them has got, uh, got a lot of unique challenges and takes a lot of uh, thought to, to design a study that will, uh, will give you the best information that, uh, that you're looking for, whether it's home range or habitat use or, uh, or movements and, uh, and just uh, longevity. Uh, some of the remote uh, transmitting and receiving conditions uh, are, are, are rugged. And so that's a, that's a real consideration in designing a study, whether you have a road network or whether you're going to have to use uh, a lot of uh, uh, air, air time uh, to pick them up uh, flying. Uh, the satellite advances have uh, really helped tracking some of the bigger animals, especially, but it's pretty expensive. Uh, we still need just those basic small transmitters, lightweight and low powered uh, to track, uh, track small secretive animals. And it gives us some really good basic information uh, on those animals. And that's, uh, that's the same way it's been done since the, the 1950s. So uh, with that, I uh, to hope I didn't go too fast or too slow, but uh, if you'd like to ask some questions, I'll be glad to, glad to tell you what I know. Well, Mark, what, what was the biggest or a big surprise in behavior, something you didn't expect from, from your subjects? Oh, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, that really surprised me, and I'll, I'll tell you some of the studies that, uh, that have done have just been basic habitat use and movements of, of animals, but, but we've done some, done some studies, uh, and I, I did a series of studies on uh, beginning with raccoons uh, to look at the effects of dogs chasing raccoons. And, uh, and so we expected that uh, uh, the, the thesis uh, and the idea that we had was that, uh, that raccoons uh, 
could be chased by a pack of hound dogs and the hound dogs could uh, uh, could really chase a chase a coon out of the country and uh, and so it started uh, started following raccoons uh, for months on the end and then uh, then one night in the summer we brought in some trained uh, coon dogs and turned these coon dogs loose uh, within what we thought was about a hundred yards of, uh, of of the raccoons that had transmitters on we expected the uh, raccoons to to just take off and leave the country and uh, turns out they did uh, they just went up a tree and the dogs went on by and so we found out that these uh, the, the biggest surprise was that the, the dogs were not all that good even though uh, one night uh, during this particular study I had uh, uh, a guy brought he owned last year's and this year's in, in those particular years uh, championship uh, coon dogs and so these were these were dogs that uh, at, at the time this was 30 years ago or more, uh, he had spent, uh, for one particular dog, he paid $60,000 for it. And oh. this was 19, yeah, 1980, $85, uh, $60,000 for one, and then 30,000 for another and 20,000 for this other dog. So I had, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of coon dogs arcing up a tree at a possum. So... <laughs> Uh, so, so the biggest surprise that, that I found, it, and, and we did this for a couple of years, uh, found out that, that really the effect of the dogs was not all that great on the, the, the raccoons. They could avoid them. They could go in a hole in the ground. They could go up a tree. Uh, it was really the hunters that were having the big effect uh, on the animals, not the, not the dogs and not the chasing. They didn't, they didn't chase. And in particular, I had female uh, raccoons that, I, that had young and, and they didn't run across the country. They didn't take off and run. They stayed within their home range. That was the background work that I did was finding out what their typical movement patterns were. And then uh, they didn't alter those, those patterns at all when, when the dogs uh, hit the ground. Now, and then we did the same thing with, uh, with black bears over in the Apalachicola National Forest. So, uh, so we, we didn't find that big a difference in, in home ranges. Now, the other species that we were tracking uh, were were panthers. Now, when the deer hounds hit the woods in uh, in South Florida, the panthers really don't like that. It really disturbs them, and uh, and so they do do take off. But uh, that's just comparison of three different uh, uh, three different mammals: uh, fur bears, uh, from raccoons to bears to panthers that uh, that are looked at. Uh, with chasing, uh, chasing them with hound dogs. And, uh, and, and the response was, was similar to a degree, but when, when, the, when the deer hounds hit the woods in big packs, that, that made a difference. Thank well, you, I'm sure there's some more questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mark, have you heard about this uh, GPS uh, tracking map thing up in Voyager uh, Park up in Minnesota? Uh, the one with the wolves going on. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That's pretty phenomenal. I'll I'll do a quick share screen on this, uh, you guys. Oh, yeah. That's all right. I can stop. My shit. Oh yeah, you have to. And, and, and I'll tell you, it, it really gives us some insights into some critters. Uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So that's seven different packs in this park area, northern Minnesota, not far from here. Look how defined they are. Yeah. Like these guys, they respect each other's boundaries like crazy. Here's a animated view of that same map over uh, just over half a year. This yeah. is what these wolves would do in half a year. Oh, yeah. That's great. Amazing. And, and you know, uh, I'm glad you, you bring that up, Chris, because really if you, uh, if you know anything about territorial animals like, like wolves, panthers, uh, coyotes, uh, it, it is that they, they have boundaries and they check those boundaries. Yeah. And, and especially the wolves and coyotes, uh, if you, if you take that alpha, uh, alpha animal uh, out of the pack, uh, it just collapses. Those boundaries get shuffled around so quickly that yeah. their neighbors know it when it happens. Uh, so, uh, it, it's just amazing how, how quickly that they, they pick up on it. But, one thing that I noticed in in uh, 
in capturing uh, the animals. Uh, because in order to put a radio collar on them, you have to slow them down a little bit, catch up to them, uh, tranquilize them uh, to handle and measure and, uh, and all. Uh, with coyotes, uh, coyotes and, and raccoons for that matter, I found that I, I mostly, I caught animals. The place where I caught them was usually an area that they never spent time in uh, after that. And, and that, that made me think that a lot of the times when, whenever I caught an animal, I was catching it when it was venturing outside of its normal territory and the initial capture spot with a trap, whether it's a live trap or a leg hold trap, that initial capture spot was most often when that animal was venturing out of its territory, poking around, usually nosing around in somebody else's territory. And, uh, and so uh, I didn't find the animals going back to that area. And I thought at first it was because maybe they, uh, they had a bad experience being uh, tranquilized and handled and, and getting a, a tag, tag stuck in their ear and a collar on their neck. But, uh, but I think it was really that they're more susceptible, especially these carnivores are more susceptible to being captured when they're outside of their normal home range, an area that they didn't know uh, what was up with. So, uh, so and, and, they, and, and they do wander about like these wolves down here. I think there's another uh, article on the internet. You could probably find it if you want to. It, that from one of these packs, a male and a female went up to an area we call Red Lake. And I got to say that would be north of me. And then they coming out of Minnesota. So I would say 200 miles. And they wandered up separately. But met up at Red Lake. And then wandered back separately over weeks or whatever. Like, what the heck? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and and especially with some of these animals, we find out that that uh, they're able to find their way home from areas that that they've never been. Uh, we had a, a black bear causing a problem once, and uh, and so it we'd moved it all around the Smokies, took it uh, took it as far back as we could to the end of the road, and it would be back to the picnic area for Kentucky fried chicken the next evening. It didn't know where it was going and why. And it, it can move, move some pretty big distances uh, just overnight. And so it just became particular one became such a problem that, uh, that I talked to the folks up in Virginia and we carried this thing, drove it over 400 miles away, <laughs> dropped it off in Northern Virginia up at the Pennsylvania border. And that rascal was back within 40 miles of the park one week later, uh, where it got hit on the road, crossing the uh, road. But it was. Hey, you want some KFC? I mean, you know, get some KFC. Uh, back. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, it, uh, it was just like ringing the dinner bell. It was right back there. And what animal is so, that? What kind of animal is that? It was a black bear. Holy cow. Really really covering the ground to get back to the picnic area because that's a pretty lucrative spot. Easy. Uh, easy <laughs> Yogi <there>. bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey guys, Mark, I enjoyed that, but I got to check out, I got to be up like at four o'clock in the morning. So enjoyed the presentation. It was very interesting. Well, thank you. I'm glad you got to see me, Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> glad you got to see me too. All right. Hey, listen guys, I'm sorry. I got to leave. I'll take y'all later on. Enjoyed it. See you, Ashley. Yeah, so if, uh, if anybody's interested, we could probably get together uh, a transmitter and, uh, and do some radio direction finding around here. It's pretty easy to, uh, uh, to make a direction finding antenna. I've even used, uh, uh, I'll tell you one time, uh, I, I used just the end of a coax cable, not even hooked to an antenna to find, uh, to find a transmitter. And it was on a, uh, a raccoon that was in a tree. And it got so close that I, I could dial the receiver off to another frequency and it was still just bleeding over so loud. And, and I finally figured out it was in the mulberry tree that was above my head. <laughs> but but it, took, it took taking the antenna off entirely and just with, with open coax cable, I was able to point the, the coax cable uh, with a BNC connector on the end, point that and until I could find the critter. So uh, that, uh, that was just being extremely close and it turned out to be within about 10 feet of me. Hmm. 
Well, Mark, got... so, some of the amateur uh, direction finding stuff has attenuators. Did you, you did the professional stuff have that also? Uh, well, it did. Uh, it did. Uh, but my research projects were never uh, never funded well enough to be able to uh, uh, to to get the attenuator, and, and that's why I just learned to dial the frequency off. Right. Or, uh, or like I said, just take the antenna loose entirely. Uh, but that, uh, mm -hmm. but but having a big big attenuator would really help uh, in in those situations. Uh, but most of the time, I was straining to hear one way off in the distance to get close enough to find it. I've got something that you might be interested in. Yeah, Jack, have you seen that? Oh yeah, it's an SDR four channel, and uh, it takes four antennas. And it actually measures the uh, time uh, that it receives the signals, and it gives you a compass rose, and you can it points right to where the transmitter is. Oh, wow! Now but, uh, there's four SDRs built into this unit. Neat. Uh, Do you use that for? Is that for like Civil Air Patrol? Uh, no, I'm still putting it together. Um, there is what it's called. Everest. And. Uh, there's the uh, link to the site. Mm -hmm. And Jack, that, that would be good for almost any frequency if there are SDRs yes, in right. there. Right? As long as you have your antennas, uh, you know, trimmed to whatever frequency you're looking at. Wow. But uh, it just takes four Omni antennas and uh, it's in an X uh, pattern, uh, cross pattern. And your antennas have to be exactly so many inches apart from each other. And uh, it just measures the uh, time received and does a comparison of the uh, four receivers. And it gives you the uh, azimuth of uh, where that transmitter is. So Jack's not allowed on the next fox hunt there, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure Mark is allowed either. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a pro class for those two. <laughs> Uh, that would be a good competition. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey guys, uh, I hate to run, but yeah, uh, Mark, it was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for all of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks for coming by. Well, uh, Mark, did you get? Well, I guess I have two questions. Did did you run into humans that want to know what you're doing? <laughs> Yes, and uh, and I'll tell you one of the most interesting things. Uh, and and really, I spent a lot of time trying to trap animals to put transmitters on them. Once I got a transmitter on them, uh, that that became the easy part. But uh, but I was sitting one time, uh, sitting down below a road, checking a trap, and and I'd captured a raccoon in it, and so I tranquilized the raccoon. And I had it sitting on my lap. And I've got all my gear laid out there and I'm tagging and measuring this raccoon. And this, uh, as I checked all my traps going down this road on the wildlife management area, there was this Jeep with a bunch of rednecks uh, in it, hanging out of the, the Jeep and driving down. And, and I'd go a half mile and check a trap and then rebate it and go to the next trap. And so I get down to one and I, I catch a raccoon and, and I'm sitting here with the raccoon in my lap and it's down by the lake and uh, all tangled in vines and, and the such. And this Jeep pulls up and they see me down there. And here I'm sitting with it, again, a raccoon on my lap and I've got a live trap, a cage live trap. And, uh, and this, uh, this genius driving the Jeep says, uh, oh, are you trapping raccoons? And I said, uh, I said, well, and about that time his wife interrupted. And she said, no, he's trapping snakes because the area I was in was prime snake habitat to them. And uh, she said, I know he's trapping snakes. And I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and she started nagging him. I told you so. I told you so. I'm sitting there with a raccoon on my lap. The trap was not on the snake. The snake would drive through the, <laughs> through the trap. And, and then he just drove off with her just bending his ear and telling him, I told you I was right. I knew what he was doing. <laughs> now, when, when you dart these things, the, the guy in Kenora, our animal control guy, he used like a long tube and he would blow the thing out. 
because he said he could control how, you know, the distance and the yeah. power that it was doing. What do you have a gun or a tube or how do you administer your dart? Yeah. So, uh, so with uh, most of the, most of the critters and, and most of the ketamine that I used uh, enough to get a date for, for years and years, uh, I would use it uh, just simply with the syringe in my hand. If I had them in a live trap, I would use oh, wow. them with the syringe in my hand. Uh, with uh, with a coyote, you can grab a coyote by the neck, and it'll cower down, and you can uh, drug it then, and and then. Uh, Holy cow! Uh, <laughs> with with bears, uh, with <laughs> bears, I would use uh, either a uh, a jab stick with a, a syringe just stuck on the end of about a three foot. Uh, aluminum rod and uh it kind of distract them wave a hat in one hand and poke them in the rear with the other uh or a a, a, a co2 pistol but the the blow darts uh blow darts were easiest and most accurate really for any mid-range mm -hmm. and uh and so I, I did use that some but not much uh because if i had them in a trap i'd get them for deer for deer and elk uh, free range in deer and elk, uh, we would use a, uh, a CO2 rifle. Uh, oh, that, yeah. Cause you're further away. Eh? Yeah. And, and the trajectory on that is just, you know, with a big, big tube full of, uh, ketamine or, or romping. Uh, how, how, how do you figure out your dose? Did you look at the animal and guesstimate its weight and adjust? Yep, exactly. So, uh, estimate the weight and usually in, in 10 pound increments, uh, for for bears and uh, bears and deer, just uh, just because that was the the dosage one uh, one milligram per ten pounds, and wow. uh, that would usually take them down within a couple of minutes. If you overestimated the weight, they'd go down like a hammer. If you underestimated, <laughs> you'd have to give them a little more. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did, did you ever have a collar or, or, or tracking device that got picked up by a human and taken home to his house? Yeah. Uh, and so, so we used to, we started putting tags, especially on the bear collars with a, uh, uh, with a telephone number. And, uh, and so, and we'd say reward. And if they'd call us and say, Hey, we picked up this, uh, we shot a bear and it had this radio collar said, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll come by and give it, give, give you a $25 check. And, uh, and so, uh, I delivered a lot of $25 checks and then I'd try to get more information about, uh, uh about the animal, where they shot it, uh, where they found it. Sometimes it would be a, a collar that the batteries have been dead on it for a couple of years. And so, uh, so we'd find out, you know, where the animal had moved once the, the collar had gone dead. In one case, uh, uh, I went to pick one up and, and the fellas had, and I've been radio tracking the thing. The uh oh, we lost his internet. We're lying, but I took them their $25 check because I wanted the transmitter back. Uh, these were, each one of these radio collars was costing several hundred dollars, two or $300 a piece. We get them refurbished and uh, new batteries stuck in, and, and get them back out. But, but yeah, we go up there and uh, and then find out that uh, that yeah they they had a big big story about it. Well, yeah, we killed this one last season. No, you didn't. It's it's August and the season does not open until October. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one time I now I'll tell you this is a real real radio. Uh, a real radio shack uh, sort of story. I was uh, tracking from the air a particular uh, particular animal that uh, that had lost a river otter. I was trying to find it again, and so we were searching big area, and and I tracked that rascal to a house, and and we're here we're doing a figure eights around and figured it's in that house, and uh, and so I went uh, went and knocked on their door. We landed, uh, landed at Sevierville Airport. Uh, and if you've ever been to Sevierville, Tennessee to see Tintech, uh, the Tintech factory was right on the corner uh, at the Sevierville Airport. And, uh, and so uh, got out there and I was, a, I was pretty hot. And, uh, and so I, I drove, drove whatever the 20, 20 miles or so back to the house and knocked on the door. Nobody was home. So 
lucky for them, I came back by a couple of days later and said, hey, you know, because I was able to pull up and I kept getting this chirp, chirp, and it was kind of a funky chirp. And, uh, but it was on the frequency, kept getting it. And, uh, and so they said, uh, no, we don't have anything. I said, well, I want to see your freezer. Um, and so I went in, they had, and I walked in their living room and they were like, uh, what's this about? It's like, Hey, you know, I had all the authority of, uh, of no one, but, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm radio tracking this, uh, this river otter. And, uh, it turns out go in the living room and there's a radio shack scanner sitting there radio shack scanner and it's scanning the frequencies and it turns out the oscillator it, the oscillator uh was putting out a, uh, a particular harmonic when it scanned from one frequency to the next oh and it was chirping it was, you it was a harmonic of one of the uh, emergency radio channels there the ambulance service or whatever was on the same frequency and it made a chirp just as it was scanning through and it was scanning this cycle at about the pulse rate uh, for this particular one and it was putting that out so it told me that number one how sensitive the receivers were that we were using uh -huh. um, really really keen and sensitive and uh and so then then i was able to figure that out. so that that took some some learning i had a, an uncle who was a ham and, uh, and he helped me figure out how it was doing that uh, with the particular crystal control scanner and, uh, and giving off this harmonic in the internal uh, mechanism there. And, and that's what I was picking up. So I was able to then go to the radio shack, talk to them about it, look at the, uh, uh, look at the scanner and figure out then uh, a little better what it was doing. But they didn't have my river otter. I figured it was in the freezer, uh, but, <laughs> But in that particular case, uh, it was just their Radio Shack scanner. Uh, wow. Tread lightly, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so I've had, had a lot of fun. It, it really, it's been 30, I guess, 35 years or so, 37 years of uh, radio tracking and, and doing these studies and some of the some of the work we're doing with the fish and these uh, – uh, these sonic tags uh, is is pretty neat because really we're we can home in on them with a direction finding uh, 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 microphone, but uh, but the way we're we're tracking those and the way Christina did for years was uh, was track them over large scale movements. And so we're watching for those those fish to move hundreds of miles, and uh, and that took uh, took a lot of boat work for hundreds of miles. Oh, what what a great job! It's uh, it's been a lot of fun, but then then there's some days they have to pay me to do it. <laughs> did you ever did you ever put one of those on a human? Well, uh, in fact, in fact, uh, one of the other other ways we use these transmitters besides putting them on animals uh, was to put them on a human and try to practice. And so we'd practice with some of the some of the classes at the university where I was. Uh, was uh, on the, the faculty uh, would track uh, track somebody, let them run around through the bushes, and uh, and then practice direction finding, and uh, and see how accurate we were. But we uh, we also uh, would do this uh, again doing the figure eight with uh, uh, with the airplane uh, when we were interested in looking at the habitat the animals were in and doing better descriptions of it, other than just saying it's in a big pine tree. Uh, we would take a transmitter wrapped up in, in foam uh, and drop it out of the airplane. And sometimes we'd throw it down uh, out of the window of the airplane. And then uh, uh, the idea would be to come back later, uh, home back in on the transmitter on the ground, because we know the bear is going to move, but we could come back then to the ground and uh, measure the vegetation and look at uh, what the animal was doing there uh, do uh, do vegetation plots and and really accurately spend some time, a couple hours at each spot describing the uh, the habitat that the species was in, and and again with bears, you know you you've gotten pretty close when you come back and you find your transmitter all chewed up, and the phone chewed off by the bear that you were throwing it at, so 
habitats. We, we were pretty accurate and thought we were getting it into the right habitat uh, with, with those, uh, uh, those techniques. They like chewing plastic, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. They like chewing jerry cans, too, if they're empty gas cans, I found out. Yeah. They, they probably thought it was a hamburger you threw at them. <laughs> and when they found out it wasn't, they get mad. <laughs> Well, if you put it in a big red and uh, red and white striped bucket, they thought it was KFC. Yeah, I think down here, I think uh, Water Burger would be better. Yeah. <laughs> and blueberry. Okay, uh, what does the antenna look like on the airplane when you're chasing around? What do we... Uh, uh, we use the the same. Uh, uh, just took a wooden block and a uh, uh, a couple of. Uh, hose big hose clamps and and clamp this wooden block that bolted at an angle the uh, uh the standard two element h uh yagi antenna that short one one on each wing but we just uh took uh took hose clamps and put that around the strut on the the wing on, on each wing and then ran the coax cable out and before the days of uh, zip ties we just used used uh uh black electrical tape and, and tape the cable so it's not flapping in the wind uh, on the wings. I think the pilots call it 100 mile an hour tape, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you count the antennas out a bit each side? So like... Yeah, so they, they were pointing uh, essentially at a 45 degree angle, uh, the way the strut was uh, uh, from this, this Cessna, uh, the way the strut was angled, uh, we could... Uh, put it on there and it came down at about a 45. And then that way with the antenna switch, we could listen left and right. You know which side the thing's on? Yeah. Cool. What a great job. Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> we, uh, um, back in the old days, uh, when I was first got out of the Navy, uh, my license had expired. Uh, I'd let it go too long. And I still was, uh, fixing radios and stuff for my friends, but I, I couldn't transmit. But uh, we had, uh, we did a, we did a fox hunt um, and um, I, I, I had a, a, just a round loop, you know, you could turn it outside my car. And a bunch of was trying to find this guy and he's transmitting and we're looking for him and we drove around. We thought it was him, we'd drive by his house and he didn't even have an antenna. Or he didn't have an antenna, we had an antenna or nothing. And we finally gave up, and here he was, he was translating, he was uh, activating his cyclone fence. So, you know, it was like a long fence and we couldn't pinpoint on it. Yeah. But he was, he was using the fence as an antenna. Huh. You know, but, uh, we know yeah. that we were, yeah. because the fence was probably like a couple of hundred feet long and- Hard to know, get a bearing on it, eh? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, so uh, finding finding uh, leaky transformers on the utility lines, it's uh, sometimes just a matter of driving along and finding where it gets loudest and then, then pinpointing uh, that, but having a, a direction finding antenna with an old AM radio really, really helped pinpoint things like that. You know, I, I had to do that last year. Uh, when I come down, uh, I'm over here at, in, in Haven. And I was getting a really loud noise, especially, uh, especially like uh, out of rain or a particular day when there were certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I said, man, it's got to be something arcing. So I drive around the neighborhood. It was within a couple of blocks of me, sort of like northeast of me. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I said, I'm going to find this thing. So I I borrowed a, a two meter antenna from. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim McQuay, and I had a, I had a, a FT8, a 817, and I walked around with that, and I was able to find the, the, the transformer, it was about a block and a half away from me, at least the, the pole, it was that pole, right. and I, and I called, uh, I called the company, and they came out the next day, and I, and the guy said, well, how do you know that's it, so I, Took the antenna and I went over there. I should I say, look, you know, he said, Oh, yeah, man, I'll have to check it all out. So he said, That's pretty cool, you know. But, but I, I found it, you know, using that. Uh, and I, I used I used it on, on um, 
I think I used it on two meters. Hmm. Two meters AM, I picked it up. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Track it down. Well, some some folks in, in some of the clubs that are doing a lot of uh, uh, fox hunting, uh, some of the folks really get into building these small transmitters, and uh, and so that's uh, that's another part aspect of the uh, uh, of the activity is building the the transmitters and powering them up and and then concealing them, hiding them so it's not so obvious. You really have to be be sharp to be right up on it. I uh, I wanted to. I wanted to I wanted to do that up north. I got the idea for you guys down here, but when I go to Cleveland and I thought, well, no big deal. I'll go make me a little transmitter. When I started looking at it, I said, wait a minute. He's pretty elaborate. They, he didn't send out, the, you know, it's they pulse, they stop. You can send it. You can even program the, you know, a, a certain ID in it. So I looked into it and I said, you know, it's, it's a little more than one of, a little more than one of building a, in a couple hours here. So, but I, <laughs> I, I was thinking it would just be a little oscillator, you know, and a, and something give a little chirp or something. But they they can get pretty elaborate. Mm -hmm. But I decided to I did get decided to buy one, and I think they're like a hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah. Well, the Panama City Club owns one, doesn't it, Greg? Yeah, uh, well, somebody owns one because uh, we we done that out back uh, out there by uh, back at the club there. We have three of them, I think. Oh, is there, are they have different brands and any, any one better than others? Uh -huh, I don't know. Greg, didn't you buy those that we have at the club? Oh, your microphone's dead, Greg. Susie must have chewed through it. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay. <laughs> yes, the club has a couple of, uh, well, two or three. <laughs> Uh, foxes from bionics and um, i think i have one of my own and um, so we've done uh fox hunts but they've been very you know on the grounds of the clubhouse it hadn't been extended out or on the road or anything like that so but that's a subject that we had never talked about on Beginner's Academy, so I'm glad we opened it up. I think we need to have some fox hunts. <laughs> so, Well, Easter's coming up. Yeah, well, the beauty of it is that anyone can participate because they don't have to have a license if they're just using a receiver. So, yeah. yeah. And in, in Puerto Rico, I used to go down there. I had a house. I went down there for the winter. And I really got involved with the ham radio guys down there. And they really are really a tight group up there because the, 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 to them, it's an important because of all the hurricanes they get. So they, they stay they stay close. Uh, and they like a lot of portable stuff and, and things like that. Or they even like being able to make antennas out of junk that's laying around. And I went around. You know, showing them how to make an antenna with PVC and a certain length of wire and stuff like that. But uh, for uh, for Easter, I decided to have a party. And uh, my wife says, "Well, Easter, that's Easter." And I said, "Well, they have uh, egg hunts, you know. Why don't you have an egg hunt, you know?" I said, "Well, they don't, they don't, I don't want to buy no eggs or nothing like that." So what I did is I went to one of those dollar dollar general things, and I bought little cheap pliers and little cheap screwdrivers and little cheap knives and I hit them all over the place and then we have we just had like a hunt for those things like if there were eggs but you know be you're getting hot you're getting hot you know cold cold you know that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it wasn't like it wasn't what it all was right. but but they got a big kick out even the even the wife participated yeah. and she goes hey I got a lousy screwdriver I don't want lousy screwdriver I'll trade you for the for the little flashlight you know and stuff like that but it it became a lot of it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Mark, KD4IMA, for enlightening us and, and, and sharing his uh, really interesting uh, career. And uh, uh, I, th I think you got into something good, Mark. Let's... Yeah, well, good. Well, well thank you. I, I appreciate uh, you all taking the time to listen. And uh, 
it's important to point out there was not one fox harmed during this presentation. In the making of this presentation. That's right. <laughs> right. The right. foxes survived. Everything else died, but the foxes are okay. <laughs> yep. As far as we know. <laughs> <laughs>